Tonight, tough questions over the controversial Greenbelt land swap as Ontario's Premier doubles down. We're going to build homes until people have the same opportunity that you have. The housing minister's response to a scathing report. I completely accept the responsibility. The criticism and the calls for his resignation. The rising death toll after a devastating apartment fire in South Africa. The smoke is coming to me. After that, I just fall down. The tragedy highlighting a growing housing crisis there. It was bound to happen. Plus, festival freebies for a life-saving cause. This must be the place where you can get free naloxone. One couple's unique take on tackling the overdose crisis. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Reporting tonight, Vashi Capellos. Good evening. The housing crisis affecting so many Canadians has also led to a political one for Ontario's government. Even Premier Doug Ford admits there were problems with the plan to develop protected Greenbelt land, but he insisted today he's sticking with it. There are also growing calls for Ford's housing minister to step down, but as CTV's Heather Wright reports, he's offering an apology instead. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Ontario's embattled housing minister has no intention of stepping down as calls for his resignation grow louder. So I want to make it very clear uh, to Ontarians that uh, I'm sorry that we didn't do a better job. During a 15-minute news conference, Steve Clark apologized for his handling of the Greenbelt file, which Ontario's integrity commissioner called a rushed and flawed process marked by unnecessary hastiness and deception. The report released yesterday concluded it was Clark's since resigned chief of staff who chose what land would be released from Greenbelt Protection, but says Clark did not question or properly oversee the selection process. This comes on the heels of a scathing report from the Auditor General, who found developers with close ties to Doug Ford's government influenced the decision to open up Greenbelt land to development. Now some stand to make billions. I completely um, accept the responsibility that I was uh, overly reliant uh, on my chief and, and my staff. I regret that I didn't provide the uh, sufficient oversight. Clark used the phrase accept responsibility 13 times, you, evading specific questions about the premier's involvement in this file and why he seemed to know so little about a decision he concedes was a big one. I take full responsibility. The buck stops with me. The premier standing by his minister. We understand the process could be better, but our goal at the end of the day is to build 1.5 million homes at minimum. The province maintains Greenbelt land is needed to solve Ontario's housing crisis, though its own experts say it's not. Premier Ford appearing to grow frustrated with reporters' questions this morning. That you have a home, but do you know many people don't have a home? All three opposition leaders have demanded Clark resign, as have all the chiefs of Ontario First Nations. The longer the Minister Clark sticks around, the more this sticks to the Premier. And experts point out that aside from one staffer, no one has been held accountable. I heard the Minister and the Premier repeatedly say they're taking responsibility. How, in what way? Well, the Integrity Commissioner called the process used to remove land from the Greenbelt reckless and chaotic. The province has no plans to reverse course or start over. Had the right CTV News, Toronto. BC's premier did something today very few politicians do. He wrote a letter to the Bank of Canada's governor asking him not to raise interest rates next week when a decision is expected. I think it is critically important to go on the record as the premier of British Columbia to point out to the Bank of Canada that Statistics Canada is saying that the biggest driver of inflation in our country right now is rising mortgage rates. The bank's key lending rate currently sits at 5%, the highest in more than two decades. 18 months ago, in March of last year, it sat at just 0.5%. And BNN Bloomberg's John Ehrlichman is here. Hey, John. Good to see you. Uh, good yeah. to see you, too. How rare is it for a politician, a premier, no less, to ask the Bank of Canada to do something, or in this case, not do something? You know, a popular response might be that this is rare, and yet, in the current political environment, we have seen federal leaders on the left and the right calling out central bank policies, so maybe we shouldn't be surprised to see a premier doing so as well. And this kind of tension, Vashi, 
is something that led to central bank independence in the first place. I'm going to go way back to the so-called coin affair. Some Canadians might remember it involved the Bank of Canada Governor James Coyne, who ultimately resigned. There were squabbles with John Diefenbaker. That really ushered in an era of central bank independence, but there were still squabbles along the way. Uh, Paul Martin, early on as finance minister, battling it out with the Bank of Canada Governor John Crow. Even in 2017, there were reports that the Trudeau government had tensions with the former Bank of Canada Governor Stephen Poulos. So the, the real answer here is that when interest rates go up, tensions go up too. And, and just touching on that, the impetus for the ask is the tension, the tension between you know Canadians and these successive rate hikes that are having a huge impact. People feel very stretched. There are worries about where the economy goes from here. But these rates went up to fight inflation, which can also create challenges for the economy. Now, some leaders have talked about the idea of greedflation, that businesses cause this. The Bank of Canada says, look, this is a situation where supply has to catch up with demand. And until inflation is under control, rates have to stay higher. Now, if rates came down and the economy actually stayed resilient, that actually might signal a change in this idea of central bank independence. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks, John. BNM Bloomberg's John Ehrlichman. To Washington, Ontario Conservative and one-time leadership candidate Michael Chong has been asked to share his experience as a target of Beijing's foreign interference with Congress. CTV's Annie Bergeron-Oliver has more. Clearly, a genocide is taking place in Xinjiang. An outspoken critic targeted by China, Michael Chong is now getting set to give his take to U.S. lawmakers studying Chinese threats at a special congressional commission. My case happens to be uh, a very high profile case, but there are many, many Canadians who have been targeted by Beijing here on Canadian soil and who have suffered in silence. Chong has first-hand experience to bring to the Americans. I am far from alone in experiencing Beijing's foreign interference Mm -hmm. threat activities. Mm -hmm. He's been the subject of Chinese disinformation campaigns online and in 2021, he and his family were targeted by China after he spoke out about the country's treatment of the minority Uyghurs. The government needs to take this serious national threat uh, for what it is uh, and to take it seriously and to take action to counter it. Since then, several other MPs have been briefed by CSIS and told they too have been targeted. I'd like to see the government um, actually come out with a national security strategy or at least come out with a strategy to counter hostile state activities. The opposition parties all want the Canadian government to launch a public inquiry, but months after the idea was first floated, it still hasn't happened. Though a senior government source says an announcement could come before Parliament resumes in mid-September. We could have been there by uh, already been in the inquiry by now, so that is very frustrating. A frustration for China experts too. The Congress will ask Mr. Chong Uh, what he knows about Chinese state harassment of himself and his family, but also for him to talk about why the Canadian government has not been more proactive in coming up with a public inquiry. Tonight, a senior government source tells CTV News that there are now a few people open to the idea of leading the public inquiry. Chong testifies in Washington, Vashi, on September 12th. Thanks so much, Annie. Annie Bergeron, Oliver in Ottawa. Despite recent rainfall aiding the wildfire fight, B.C. is extending its province-wide state of emergency for at least the next two weeks. The rain provided our firefighters a chance to breathe, but we are still far from being in the clear. 4,200 people remain out of their homes as crews battle more than 400 wildfires still burning. Nearly 80% of B.C. is experiencing severe drought, adding to the risk of new fires. There are still about 65,000 British Columbians on evacuation alert who could be forced to leave their homes at a moment's notice. Strong winds in the forecast have put a pause on Yellowknife's path for re-entry and are threatening other evacuated communities. Emergency crews are bracing for more fires along a key Northwest Territories highway starting tomorrow. The road that leads to Alberta could close without warning because of poor visibility. Smoke from those fires covered skies in Calgary and southern Alberta today. South Africa is in mourning tonight after fire raced through a dilapidated apartment building in Johannesburg, killing at least 74 people, 12 children are among the victims. It's one of the worst residential fires in the country's history. CTV's Vanessa Lee has the latest for us. As fire raged through this five-story building in the middle of the night, people used sheets and blankets to try and escape. Some jumped out of windows and survived. Others didn't make it. This man broke his window but struggled to climb through. 
the smoke is come to me. Yeah. After that, I just fall down. Then, from there, I don't know anything until now. Among the dead, children. The youngest was just one year old. This is unprecedented. Johannesburg has never had an incident like this where so many people die as a result of a fire. It's believed as many as 200 people were crammed inside what is considered a hijacked building, an abandoned property taken over by cartels or slumlords who rent out rooms to those who can't afford to live elsewhere, many of them recent immigrants. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa says the building used to be a shelter for women and children, but once the lease expired, it was unlawfully occupied. It's a wake-up call for us to begin to address the situation of housing in the inner city. Critics say the problem isn't new, with the vulnerable living in unsafe conditions in hundreds of hijacked buildings in the city's dilapidated business district. This is not an accident. Uh, the, this for me, it's made our capable homicide because it, it was bound to happen. Officials are still looking into the cause of the fire. Initial evidence suggests it started with a candle as people tried to keep warm during that country's winter months. Vanessa Lee, CTV News, Montreal. The first hurricane of the season for the southeast United States has moved out into the Atlantic, but not before Adalia hit Florida and at least three other states. As CTV's Bill Fortier reports, damages are already estimated to be in the billions. As evacuees returned to this normally picturesque town on Florida's west side, they found devastation. What matters is what I'm holding right here, okay? It's just material stuff. I know. It's just so retirement, our own life. This shrimp fishing boat was left hung up on a seawall. Its owner managed to free it with a lot of help from neighbors. Well, I've lived here my whole life, but the people here is like family. Horseshoe Beach and many others across the Florida area known as Big Bend took a direct hit. It's pretty rough. We uh, never seen anything like it before. As Hurricane Idalia churned its way across that state, then moved up the coast to Georgia, where heavy rain flooded streets and at least one person was killed. We do have one reported fatality in Lowndes County from a tree falling on a vehicle. In South Carolina, there was flooding in the streets of Charleston and roofs ripped off homes. All I did was close the front door and... So like seconds? Before. Seconds. I mean, if I hadn't gotten the front door, it'd probably suck me out the front door. And more flooding as far as North Carolina, leaving businesses, including this salon, partly submerged. I worked till about 7 last night and um, wasn't really prepared for a flood like this. In hardest hit Florida, work is underway to restore power for hundreds of thousands. The state's governor requested a federal major disaster declaration that was approved today by the U.S. president. I'm here to make clear that our nation has your back. This will allow us to start debris removal and will provide funding for individual assistance. The cleanup is already underway. The longer term goal is rebuilding. Guessing it will be up towards half a million dollars. Um, because we're having to totally gut all of our hotel rooms. Still surrounded by utter destruction, some are already optimistic. It's going to be good. It's going to be fun. Today, Idalia was downgraded to a tropical storm before it headed out to sea. Initial estimates pin recovery costs around $20 billion, much less than some previous hurricanes, because this one largely avoided the bigger cities. Bill Fortier, CTV News, Edmonton. Hawaiians impacted by the devastating wildfires there are getting help from two celebrities who call the islands home. We have created the People's Fund of Maui that will put money directly in the hands of the people who need it right now. So if you Oprah Winfrey and Dwayne The Rock Johnson donated $10 million and are urging others to join in. The wildfires killed at least 115 people earlier this month. Coming up after the break tonight. The Ottawa man behind a massive explosion gets his prison sentence. Plus, police pull over a protruding passenger.
An Ottawa man has been sentenced to five years in prison for his role in a February explosion that destroyed several homes and injured a dozen people. Cody Crosby admitted to stealing water heaters from construction sites, leaving live natural gas lines open. That's what led to the early morning blast in an Ottawa suburb that sent six people to hospital. I don't think there's a sentence that could remove the lifelong impact um, and trauma that living through something like that will have uh, for these families. Crosby's lawyer says the 35-year-old stole the water tanks to fund his addiction to fentanyl. The woman accusing a former New Democrat MP of sexual assault is going public. Former Quebec politician Romeo Saganash was charged earlier this summer by Winnipeg police. And today, Carmen Roy says she's speaking out to support others. CTV's Manitoba Bureau Chief Jill Makishan reports. Initially, the only name made public in the court documents was his. Romeo Saganash, a prominent Indigenous politician and lawyer, a residential school survivor who worked to establish the rights of Indigenous peoples around the world at the United Nations. Saganash is accused of sexual assault, and the alleged victim, Carmen Roy, who could have had her identity protected by a court publication ban, is instead making her name public. I don't want to be silent, she said in a statement issued through her lawyer, and I think it's important to use my voice to help other victims of sexual trauma. I am exploring my legal options and look forward to achieving justice and accountability. Roy works at the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation. Saganash was also connected to the organization. The director of the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation said she supports Roy's courage. We are deeply concerned that an incident took place at an off-site event where NCTR staff were present. That incident is now before the courts. A Winnipeg police statement alleges the sexual assault occurred at the beginning of May. Saganash was arrested at the end of June. Saganash's lawyer said these allegations are new and legal work is just beginning. He said Romeo Saganash will speak eventually in a statement through his lawyer. Jill Makishan, CTV News, Winnipeg. Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty in his Georgia election fraud case. He waived the right to appear in court next week. The former president is charged with trying to overturn the state's 2020 election. He turned himself into the Fulton County Jail last week, which is where this mugshot was taken. In total, Trump faces 13 felony counts for allegedly pressuring officials to reverse the results of the election. The Republican leader in the U.S. Senate has been given the green light to resume work after a health scare. 81-year-old Mitch McConnell, who suffered a concussion back in March, froze for nearly 30 seconds, taking questions from reporters yesterday. <clears throat> Did you hear the question, Senator, running for re-election in 2026? In a statement, Dr. Brian Monahan, the attending physician to Congress, said McConnell is medically clear to continue with his schedule as planned. U.S. President Joe Biden spoke to McConnell today. So I'm confident he's going to be back to his old self. McConnell also froze up during a news conference back in July. Still ahead this evening, a family reunion of sorts. The siblings seeing each other for the first time in Newfoundland, thanks to a DNA test. A humanitarian delegation that met Canadians jailed in Syrian prisons is calling on Ottawa tonight to provide consular support for them. They don't have sufficient doctors. They don't have the uh, infrastructure to feed, house, and certainly not educate when it comes to the children. Nearly two dozen Canadians are living in detention camps meant for suspected ISIS fighters. The government has offered to bring back only the children, arguing the men and women are security risks. A Newfoundland man has two newfound siblings at the age of 78. John Connors met his brother and sister from Florida for the first time this week after they tried to trace their ancestry through DNA testing. I use the term serendipity because it's like finding something very valuable or special uh, when you weren't looking or weren't expecting. All of the siblings are in their 70s. They share a father who served in the U.S. Army and was stationed in the province during the Second World War. Over to northeast Nebraska, where police officers got quite a surprise when they stopped a vehicle after receiving a tip. 
They found a Watusi bull named Howdy Doody riding shotgun in a Ford Crown Victoria that had been specifically modified. Police say the vehicle and bull took top honors at a rodeo parade last month, but officers weren't really clear as to why the bull's owner decided it was a good idea to drive down a street in one of the state's biggest cities. They issued a warning and Howdy Doody headed back home. After the break, their friends or just strangers around them might be in danger and they do have this ability to help them. Making a difference at music festivals, one couple's unique way of addressing the overdose crisis. Back in a moment. On Overdose Awareness Day, we want to share with you tonight the story of two people trying to stop the deadly effects of the opioid epidemic. More than 100,000 North Americans die from overdoses every year. More than 7,000 Canadians alone passed away from an overdose just last year. But there's medication that can help if more people could get their hands on it. And that's where this young couple comes in. Here's CTV's Heather Butts. At music festivals across the U.S., there's a booth drawing a lot of attention. Between sets of their favorite bands, fans can get the tools and knowledge to reverse an opioid overdose. People become a little bit more open-minded to the fact that um, uh, their friends or just strangers around them might be in danger, and they do have this ability to help them. This must be the place, a temporary name that stuck. Wherever we go, whatever festival we're at, this must be the place where you can get free naloxone. Really slow and low breathing. The nonprofit works to normalize the conversation about drugs while teaching people how to use naloxone, a medication used to reverse the effects of opioids. Mama. With their corgi for a mascot, William Perry and Ingela Travers Hayward draw a crowd with their unique style. Everyone is willing to carry this and we just sort of get to be the place where they can actually take it yeah. for free. In two years, they've handed out more than 30,000 kits, now reaching their goal of roughly one in 20 people at a festival. Down in the pit, your 360 line of sight and the people that you can get to is roughly 20 to 25 people. My cousin passed away from an overdose, so I think it's important. Perry has seen the effects of the opioid epidemic firsthand. He spent a large part of his life struggling with addiction and is now a recovery counselor. There's absolutely nothing I can do to bring back the friends that I've lost, but there is something that I can do to hopefully prevent someone else from going through that pain. Festivals are just a distribution site. There's hope in knowing the naloxone goes home into communities in need. It's everywhere yeah. now and you can't really live in this way of saying it's not going to impact me. Making these kits even more critical, giving people the tools to help save a life. Heather Butts, CTV News, Toronto. And that does do it for us tonight. I'm Vashi Capellos. In for Omar, for all of us here at CTV National News, thank you so much for watching. Have a great evening, and I look forward to seeing you back here again tomorrow.